This talk was delivered to a very large audience on January 1984 at the Cora Hotel, Upper Wilburn Place, London. The conference was arranged by Dave Barnard, then chairman of the BJA London area, who had persuaded Mr. Leggett of the dire need for a lecture about the true nature of Judah. Trevor Price Leggett, born in 1914, started Judah at Budokai, where his teacher was Yukio Tani. Later, he studied at the Kodokan in Tokyo. For many years, he was the highest graded non-Japanese in the world. He's been responsible for training many people, dozens and dozens, up to international standard, far more than anyone else. He also required his advanced pupils to be well versed in every aspect of Judo, so that they were fit to become teachers. He was an extremely harsh teacher in the old tradition and did not countenance any form of weakness in advanced students. It is factual to say that his influence, first hand and then second and third hand through his pupils and their pupils, has spread throughout Britain. This is not always realized, but particularly by those whose knowledge of judo is poor. He is the top authority on judo in this country. No one else comes anywhere near him. For those interested in the more traditional and unusual facets of Judo, I would recommend particularly of the 30 books he has written, Zen and the Ways, published by Routledge, Kagan, Paul. In the talk, which lasts about 40 minutes, there was a short break for a change of tape. There's also quite a lot of background noise. The other side of the tape is blank. The Kano referred to as Dr. Jigoro Kano, who founded Judo in 1882, and not his son, Risei. Yuki Otani must not be confused with his pupil, M. Otani. The exercises for the piano referred to was to play with a matchbox resting on the back of each hand. The arm lock specialist, who always exacted a payment in the form of an ache in the elbow, was Ito. Some 15 years or more later, during my years in Japan, Ito, then 8th Dan, was still around and still with the same reputation. The former Kojigari, banned for a while in Japan, I leave you to work out. Obviously, I can only make and distribute a certain number of these tapes, therefore I would ask you to make a payment for what Judah has given you. This in the form of making two or three copies and passing them on to others. Please try to do this so that many people are reached. Thank you. Listen carefully now. Well, when I was a boy, I heard Dr. Carnell speak in London. He was then 70, my age now. I thought he was a remarkable old boy, but uh, I wasn't very impressed with remarkable old boys then, so I don't expect anyone to be impressed. <laughs> his complete works, his complete writings have just been published in Japan. And I had a sort of telex sent, and uh, they were airmailed to me. There are about 1,200 pages here, written in the old style of Japanese. They're not easy to read, but I've read bits of them in preparation for this. I'll just read you one little extract about Judon's support. Now things change, but this was the opinion of uh, Dr. Kano, the founder of Judo, and uh, it's a rough translation of a summary of a short article in 1929. Recently competitive sports have become popular, and often the question comes up as to the relation between competitive sports and Judo. The question's put in various forms. But there are two extremes. There are those who attack competitive sports and say that since in our country, Japan, we have the martial arts, Ujitsu, which are splendid for either spiritual education and for physical education. So what necessity is there for all the difficulties involved in importing foreign sports? 
If we practice our own indigenous Bujutsu arts, then we shall encourage the spirit of the Japanese people in a natural way. And we'll also be training in virtue. But the import of uh, foreign sports will naturally affect the spirit also, and perhaps we shall end up as foreigners. Then again, there are others who point to the advantage of sport, who say judo itself should be popularized as a form of competitive sport. And it must be completely reduced in its practice to the form of contest, like sports. Neither of these ideas is correct. One can think that each side has set out with some already clear notion of what the relation between judo and sport will have to be. As I've often explained, judo is a way which has great universality. In the variety of its applications, there are many different aspects. Martial arts, physical education, the cultivation of intelligence, cultivation of virtue, methods of application in daily life. Competitive sport is a kind of sport where there's a struggle for victory. And by that alone, there is a natural training of the physical body and also a moral culture. If competitive sport is pursued correctly in this sense, it does have a great effect in physical and psychological training, and there's no quarrel about that. But that object of competitive sport is simple and narrow, whereas the objective of judo is complex and wide. Competitive sport pursues only one part of the objective of judo. Of course, judo can be treated simply as a competitive sport, and it may be all right to do so. But the ultimate objective of judo cannot be attained in that way. So while we recognize there is a demand these days to treat judo on the lines of a competitive sport, on the other hand, we must not forget what is the real essence of judo, where it lies. Now, in this book, the same point comes up again and again and again that a competitive sport is something apart from our lives. We become experts at tennis. Well, then we are expert tennis players. It does improve the physical health, but that's where it will stop. It has no application to our lives. Now, he based his principle of judo as a method of learning something for life. It's been said, there are no rehearsals for life. You're on the stage. But Dr. Carnot thought of judo as a sort of rehearsal for life, to learn things for our lives. Now, the first principle, for instance, that he put out was, came from Buddhism. Jita Choi, self and others, mutual benefit. Now, we don't think of that so much as a spiritual idea. We think of a good man. The good man sacrifices his own things for others. But in, in contrast is the wise man who's able to benefit himself as well as others. And the view of Dr. Carnot is that you cannot, in fact, do much good to other people unless you have cultivated yourself. We think, oh, no, no. Do good to others. <coughs> now, Dr. Carnot said, study. Again and again in these things, he says, study yourself, do research yourself, find these things out for yourself. He said, don't read many books. Read a few really good books and know them minutely, in detail. One of the things he recommended was the study of history. We always think, I want to do good. But we never think of whether we ourselves are going to be able to do good. Now, one of the points of history is the Roman emperor, who at 18 became emperor and was an artist and a musician. He wanted to replace the blood-stained triumphs by a triumph of art, where the victors would be artists and musicians and dancers. He wanted to make Rome culture. And he passed a law under which any slave who was ill-treated could appeal to the magistrate, show the mark, and the magistrate would must then order a compulsory sale. So by that one act, he took away torture from the lives of perhaps a million people. There were probably a million slaves under the Roman Empire. Well, that's doing good. But that emperor was nearer. And in ten years' time, he was personally taking part in the tortures himself because he had not cultivated himself. 
Dr. Connor made a big point of this. <coughs> to benefit others and benefit the self at the same time. Now, to give some examples of this, he doesn't specify very much what benefit is, but he says find it in yourself, cultivate it in yourself. Intelligence should be cultivated in yourself. And the judo training is simply a means of cultivating courage, will, and intelligence in these forms of attack and defense. He said the same thing can be learned but in other ways. Now he gives the example, all the big department stores in Japan were originally, in the hundred years ago, just haberdashery shops. They just sold cloth. And then when the westernization of Japan began, they extended their business and they became these huge department stores, sort of Selfridges, Tokyo. But they all began in a small way, selling cloth. Now he said, but it will be a mistake to think their business success is tied up with selling cloth. They learned how to buy and sell by buying and selling cloth. Then they extended it to everything else. And he said, our judo must give us qualities which we can use in our daily life. And we must study how to apply what we learn in judo to our lives. The literature, well, he wrote these literature on the one hand, which stands in Japanese, the word bun, for culture. Bu is the fighting, will, and courage on the other hand. These two, now this was a very old ideal in Japan. There are two, uh, there are two characters. That meant writing literature, especially poetry. And this one, now I give these things because Dr. Kano himself gave them. That meant culture, refinement, and clarity of vision and intelligence. And this was fighting ability, willpower, concentration, and the ability to remain calm in a crisis. Now he divided this character up, and he did it with the Europeans, so I'll do it. This part here means to check or stop. And this was the old character for spear. So it means to check the spear. Not using a spear to attack people, but to check a spear. This was the fundamental basis of your power, which you get through practicing judo. Intelligence and power, those two. And he explains these things with many examples, and um, he says we must not specialize in the training without thinking what the training is for. The true man is not a tool, not an implement. We may be paid to do something, to build bridges. But if we neglect the inner culture and development of our intelligence and will and sense of beauty, then we're just an implement. We're just something that builds bridges. If we teach judo, we mustn't teach just technique, just be an instrument for teaching technique. We must develop our own intelligence and thought. In judo, is a, judo is a good example of a constructive system of training because in judo the impossible happens. My father saw, about 1903, Tani when he came to the West. And uh, he's very impressed with him, as the whole West was. <coughs> Tani appears, for instance, in one of Bernard Shaw's early plays, Major Barbara. Uh, marvelously defeating a huge wrestler. My father saw this. When he finally found out that I was doing judo, he said, what's he teaching? So I showed him some of the things that Koji got into. He said, well, no, it's not the real stuff. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've seen him beat a huge man. He must have touched some nerve center to paralyze. He could never throw that big man otherwise. The impossible happened. 
Now, in judo, one of the beauties of it originally was that any means could be used. Absolutely any. Provided it was not dangerous to the opponent. There weren't all these rules that we have now. And that meant there was a great scope for surprise and the exercise of intelligence. Surprise. When the possibilities become very few, it's very difficult to surprise anyone. We know everything that can happen. As you do in a game of tennis, you know everything that can happen. But in judo, you can practice for 20 years with the best and still see something entirely new. Technique is developed. But we shouldn't become slaves to fixed ideas and analyses of technique. I learned the piano under, as a kid under a, one of the teachers of the old school, a pupil of the great Oscar Beringer. And he taught me to play the scales with a matchbox balanced here. Pass the thumb underneath, but keep the back of the hand level. I could do this. I made quite good progress. And then my father sent me to a very famous teacher. And one of the first things he said to me is, uh, why do you keep your hand so flat? I said, oh, I can balance the matchbox. <laughs> I thought he was going to challenge me to do it. And he said, what for? Well, I didn't know any bad words then, but I thought, oh, gosh. And he said, throw your hand up when you pass the thumb to me. Well, that gave me a lifelong <coughs> uh, suspicion of technique. But when I'd finished laughing at this 200-year-old tradition, I realized they made good pianists. It may not have been necessary, but they made good pianists. Some of them could play faster than our best people today. It may have been oppressive, it may have been unnecessarily difficult, but it did also get results. Technique is something one thinks one's analyzed it and can get it out straight, what's the best way to do it, but it doesn't necessarily follow. Now, one of the things Dr. Kano said is, Retain clear, clearly, what your objective is. You want a wide range, and also there's a narrow range. Now, we know this from golf, for instance. Beginners, when they first play golf, they come to hit the ball, but before they've hit it, they've looked up to see where it's gone. And as a result, they miss it altogether. You have a wide range, how far to hit it, where to hit it. You get the idea, the feeling in your body. Then you hit the ball. You don't look up. You look up and look at the photos of the great professionals. You'll see, even after the club's gone through, they're still looking down. But the beginners, before they've hit it, they're looking up. In this way, the extra thought interferes with our golf. Now, many golfers spend their whole lives doing that. They never succeed in controlling it because they have no mental control. They resolve to keep their heads down. Put up the Mental control is a very important part of judo training. <coughs> we need courage. And, uh, well, we haven't had a war here for <coughs> major war for a long time. But uh, people who've been through some of the worst of it say that uh, judo contests can sometimes be more frightening than actual danger. And to that extent, our contests are very good training. It's not a question of being frightened and going through. But if the training is pursued, there's an inner sort of calmness. In the face of something very extreme, perhaps death, perhaps something unpleasant, then we shall know whether our judo training has had some effect. Then we may have a medical catastrophe. The doctor says, well, you say, shall I get better? He says, some of these cases make progress. Well, uh, what about mine? He says, oh, we can't know. <coughs> Afterwards we know whether that was a good one or a bad one. 
so you, if you know a consultant, you say, what are the figures? I want to know. He says, one in five. Well, that's not so easy. But if we have practiced judo, in the full sense, then it will slowly come to help us. And when we come back home and find our home has been gutted by fire, we may find we are not nearly so upset as might be expected. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kano in uh, Italy was in a coach. One of the members of the Japanese uh, embassy was with him. And the coach uh, went off the uh, road and was halfway over the edge of a cliff. And there was a certain amount of uh, hysteria mm -hmm. among the passengers. But that man from the embassy, he said, Dr. Kano was quite on. He knew it might go over any second. We have to become able to meet disadvantages. In most sports, if something goes wrong, people say, Oh, you can't expect me to go, I've got a bad elbow. But in judo, no. We can go on with injuries. We know the body's only 30% effective, 20% effective, but we are not demoralized. And this can be a great help for our lives. The saying there is, every man has seven faults. Well, in spite of our faults, to know that we have faults and yet to find ways of lessening them and to avoid having those faults completely destroy our lives. Judo will help us with that if we think of the time when we are injured. Not demoralized. Injured, but not demoralized. We have to become resourceful, we have to become objective. A uh, teacher, an expert on the ground, whom I saw and knew at the Kodokan, he was a vicious man. He used to put the locks on and he would just put it on a little bit to hurt. Not to do any damage, he never did any damage at all, but he would just hurt. He was an expert on locks on the ground and in those days the rules were wider, there were more. Well, I practiced with him and uh, experienced this, and I saw him injuring other people, and people didn't like to practice with him. But then I realized, no, I'm wrong. He's a most unpleasant man, and it's not very nice to have these, just these little pains, but you can learn a lot. And I did practice with him regularly. And as a matter of fact, after a time, he, he ceased to doing it. <laughs> we have to learn. Hold tightly, let go lightly. If something, I'm holding something, somebody presses back here. Now, I may hold like mad, but sooner or later, the pain here is going to be too bad. I have to let go. Then I'm cooled off balance. If we are holding the opponent, and he slowly gets out, I hold on and on and on, and it goes and goes, then up again, pull. To hold tightly, then when I realize it's gone, instead of holding on, I can retain the balance. Well, this can happen in life. We must apply this in life. To try something very hard, put all we have into it, and then <coughs> it begins to go. We say, no, no, hold on, don't go, don't go. And then we're left longing and regretting, but instead to be able to. Judah can teach us that. And Dr. Connor says, find these applications to your daily life. Don't just practice Judah on the mat. When we fall, we learn the first thing is to fall with the whole body. We try and keep off the ground. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, it all comes down to one small point. To fall with the whole body. In the same way, when we have a failure in life, to use our judo practice and completely take that failure. But we tend to say, oh, it's not unlucky. Blasted thing. It was their fault they let me down. Or most often, well, I wasn't feeling very good. Dr. Tartakov, a great chess master, and also in his youth a duelist, he was a Hungarian in the Hungarian army. He said once, I've never beaten a man, either at chess 
or a dueling who was wholly well. <laughs> we have to we have to develop faith. A judo can give us faith. We try something, no chance at all. Sometimes in uh, Kodokan they're arranged in grades, they used to be, standing on the wall. Uh, all the fourth stands, all the fifth stands together. They move up one of the grades. Well, the first time you go on with some fat, scarred, hard, bitten dog. Well, it isn't that you can't throw him. You couldn't shift him. <laughs> well, you think, oh, for oh, good, thank you. I've been doing judo seven years now. I can't even shift him. But you have the faith in yourself. And you practice with him every day. And then one day you find he's got a weakness. And then you find you can exploit that weakness. And after three months, yes, you can sometimes throw him. And after six months, you can throw him a lot. And after nine months, it was not worth practicing with him. <laughs> <laughs> and when you've had this experience a little bit, these experiences are to be applied, Dr. Connor said, to our lives. Oh, I'm no good at calculations, mathematics. Can't I have friendly. Now I'm put in the office, I've got to add a lot of things. And now people think, oh, I can't add, oh, well, I have to do it slowly, many mistakes, I've got to check it again, we'll get somebody else to check it. No, instead of that, to do, <coughs> buy a book on rapid calculations and practice for 20 minutes every morning and evening and become a master of it. In these ways, judo can help our lives, not just be something on the mat. Uh, this doesn't apply to anyone else here. When you're 60, you want to learn a new and difficult language. People say, well, that's absolutely out. Absolutely out. The, uh, the brain cells are dying at the rate of 100,000 a day at your age. <laughs> you think, ah! <laughs> But if you have faith, and then you just have a look round and you find, well, you've got 10,000 million brain cells, so at that rate they'll last you 273 years. <laughs> <laughs> then you feel that. Right. And then you find you can do it. In these ways, the experiences we have at Judo are meant to be a training for these experiences in life. And if we just practice judo, and if we just teach judo as something separate from life, then it it's really probably not worth spe spending very much time on. It's not all that interesting. But if we can combine it, and perhaps in our teaching combine it, then, <coughs> they, one of the artists of the earlier part of the century, Eric Gill, now, he said that art is thought of in Britain as something, you get out your easel and you have your oils and you have <coughs> a lovely picture there. Then you go and do something else. But he said, no, art must be brought into our everyday lives. We hear, oh, what does he mean? What does he mean? He designed new typefaces, very famous, so that what you read is beautiful. Judah must be brought into our lives. People hold a pen like that. They've got to keep shifting. <laughs> Often you can see the white around the tips of the fingers. So the pen has length. It should be held here and balanced here. Then when you write, you don't have to keep shifting the hand. An expert, a high-speed shorthand writer holds it like that. In these ways, the judo principle of efficiency can be brought into our everyday lives. And Dr. Carno, this was what he insisted. What you learn in your interesting judo practice must affect your daily life. We can see, we well, as beginners, we often hold them here, don't we? And then we show our face there. And he wants to get at you like that, and he's strangling himself. Well, this often happens in daily life. <laughs> we're trying to get at something, but we're killing ourselves doing it. When we have experience, we turn away. Turn away and come out and face it. Well, in the same way in life, we're trying to get something, but we're killing ourselves to, to turn away, to be able to turn completely away. Not so easy. 
But Dr. Kano says it's in this, in just these things, that the value and the interest of judo training lies. Limitations, it teaches us to look at limitations. They tell us we've all got limitations. We must accept those limitations. There are limitations. But they're not the limitations at the beginning. Not what the expert thinks are your limitations. Those can be changed. <coughs> Edith Evans, one of our greatest actresses, she was rejected at her first hearing. In her autobiography she says, yes, they gave me a hearing and they said, well, he never. She was a genius. <coughs> if she'd accepted that limitation as they thought, it would have been a great loss. Oyama, he was a chess champion whom I knew well in Japan, where chess is a much more popular game than here. When he was a small boy, he got the idea he wanted to play, and he went to a dojo in Osaka, and they gave him a few test games. And the uh, head teacher, a man of enormous experience who trained champions, he said, my boy, you haven't got the talent for it. <coughs> to take you on as an apprentice <coughs> would be it wouldn't be honest, it wouldn't be fair to you. You haven't got the talent for this game. Go and do something else. Well, he wept. <coughs> and then the teacher said, look, I'm not taking you on as a pupil, because it's, it's not fair. If you like, after school, you can come here, and you can clean up as a servant, and you can watch the games, and you can play occasionally. But I'm not taking you on as a pupil. It wouldn't be fair to you. Well, Oyama became a champion at least ten times, and he dominated the Japanese chess. He won a hundred major competitions in the space of 25 years. If he'd accepted that decision on the limitation, he would have failed. Now, judo can teach us this. Things which are impossible to us, impossible happens. Things one would think were quite impossible, they can happen, if intelligence and will are applied. We think, oh, in everyday life. Well, now I'm giving one or two examples. You can have life expectancy in any major country. Here, and especially in America, overeating is a main cause of bad health. We think, well, that's too bad. No, there's something different, something more, which nobody's thought of. We have the meal here, and at the end, we have the sweet. That's the most tasty bit of the meal. So even when you're full, you think, oh, well. <laughs> Now in Japan, the order's different. The most tasty food comes at the beginning. You eat that. Now you can go on eating as long as you like, but it'll be plain rice and a particular pickle. It's, uh, if you're hungry, it's only enough. But it's not all that tasty. So you're not tempted to overeat. Well, now this sounds very, very simple and obvious, doesn't it? But it's affected the lives of countless millions of people that we've never <coughs> thought about changing that order. It's never occurred to us. Well, um, well I, I want to make one positive suggestion, one concrete suggestion. Um, in these books, one of the main themes, Dr. Connor says, is to study. And he says, I don't mean study by books, but actually to study. Books, well, they ought to have a government health warning on them. They're addictive, and they can seriously damage your health. Study. Now, for instance, about the cutter. He said, new cutter will be developed. Study. You think, well, tell us what to do. No, study yourselves. Find it yourselves. 
there's inspiration if we can control the mind. And after the Judah practice traditionally, they used to practice controlling the mind. Sitting quite still for five minutes or ten minutes, pouring with sweat, maybe blood, not moving. We think, well, what's the use of that? Great use. From the ability to empty the mind, inspiration comes. If you read in detail, not superficially, the account, for instance, of some of the great scientific discoveries, you find they come from this. Intense study, and then an emptying of the mind, which takes a lot of control. Linus Pauling, he's, one of the, he's won two Nobel Prizes, and he's a famous chemist with a string of discoveries to his credit, and he's just, in his old age, discovered a new form of chemical bond. He says, for dealing with problems that initially defeat me, I deliberately make use of my subconscious mind. I think about the problem when going to bed and in bed for a week or two. Then I deliberately dismiss it from my mind and forget it. That takes great control, something one's concentrated on. Deliberately forget it. And then he said, weeks or months later, as with the structure of alpha keratin, that was one of his discoveries, the answer suddenly pops into my mind. Now what Ray Ross was saying about that throw? Inspiration. It can suddenly come. But the mind normally has to be controlled. And that practice in silent sitting is one of the ways of controlling the mind. Well, the positive suggestion I, I may, of course I, anything I know about technique is 45 years up to date. So it's got no relevance to you at all. But um, <coughs> judo is an exhibition sport, as a contest sport, where a few highly trained people perform in front of cheering thousands and get little cups to put on uh, for shelves at home is one part of judo which won't affect most of the people. The purpose of judo should be to train, and one of the points about judo was to be able to apply the intelligence. There weren't fixed techniques as there are in golf. You must hit the club against the ball in a certain way. For a short putt on the green, it would be nice to take your putter out and play it like a billiard shot. Had to get the ball in, but you're not allowed to do that. But in judo, anything was allowed if it wasn't there. Now, gradually, things have been barred and checked, and it's got narrower and narrower. You can't put your thumb inside the sleeve. Why not? Well, there aren't very many people who could tell you. Can't hold the trouser leg. Can't hold the belt. Can't hold the tip of the belt. Little men used to hold the tip of the belt and sling it over the shoulder. Well, that made Judah much more interesting. A small man holding the tip of the belt was, it was like having a sort of bomb underneath him. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't keep him out. <laughs> and he got this tremendous pull here, you see, which he hasn't got over here. Now, I would suggest to uh, somebody like to think about it, in ra randori or some type of randori, to distinguish the ordinary friendly randori in which you don't have all these rules where they can do anything, not finger locks or wrist locks, they're inherently dangerous, but to open it, let them hold the trousers. And then have your contest judo under the international rules, the very narrow rules that you've got to have. If you're free to apply many different techniques, to hold in many different ways, then you can use the intelligence. And it's a training. If you're in this very narrow sphere, you can sort of entrench yourself. They say, oh, well, holding the belt enables you to defend. Yes, but it enables you to attack, too. A man who habitually defends, yes, he'll do that. But that's like a man who's playing poker, who won't bet. He just surrenders the ante each time. Well, people don't want to play with him and won't. They'll play together, something enterprising. 
And, uh, well, this is something to think about. But uh, in, in my time, just before my time, Yokosutemi was barred because uh, they used to come out like that. And Naraoka used to do the Yokosutemi, and the collarbones yeah. used to snap like twigs on a bonfire, you know? Snap, 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 his permanent. So they barred it for a time. Uh, until he was past his contest peak. And then <laughs> <laughs> well, then uh, Kowachigari was barred. I don't want to explain it now, but there's a way of doing Kowachigari which uh, has, doesn't improve the opponent's condition. <laughs> well, that was barred. Well, now it's been open. And I would suggest for your friendly practices, as distinct from contests, to open the rules and let us see intelligence and speed and balance again performing the impossible. Well, thank you.